Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of To The Point Podcast. Hope, who, hey, hope you guys are all doing well on this Tuesday. Another beautiful day uh, here in New Brunswick. And, uh, you know, was on, uh, did a show last night, was on under review with Craig, talked some hockey, but, you know, a lot has happened in the, in the world of sports. A lot of NHL action last night with the uh, divisions heating up. Also saw some interesting basketball last evening, Patrick Marlowe. Um, you know, setting a new record, uh, news on Zach Hyman, Tron Maple Leaf forward, how long he's going to be out with the knee injury. And, um, you know, the, the big, you know, a week from Thursday is the NFL draft. And the NFL draft is bigger than any other draft. It doesn't matter what sport. It gets more publicity. It gets more hype for good reason. Uh, the NFL draft to me is so compelling you got the players, you know, at the top, and then there's there's players, you know, sprinkled through. You're like, okay, hey, that guy's gonna be a really good player. But there's mock drafts, also after mock drafts, and for the past past month plus, we've heard pundits talk about where these players are gonna go. You know, what are they gonna be as pros? And it's all it's all a big debate. How who's gonna go where? And you know wh- what who what's what's gonna happen? But I thought this morning I kind of update you on. Where I think it's going, I'm going to be doing a show next week, uh, NFL draft preview. Like I said, it's next Thursday. Uh, It's a great night. Um, You know, obviously there's going to be some sports on TV, but if you got that second screen, if you got, you know, at least follow Twitter because uh, it's, it's compelling stuff. It's going to be in Cleveland this year. There are going to be some fans, so it's kind of back to normal. I know they want to have it in Vegas in the next couple of years when, when COVID's behind us and everything's back to normal with the new state, the uh, Alliance stadium uh, in Vegas and uh, you know, just, you know, Vegas becoming a, a big sports hub. Um, that, that's where they want to hold the the draft in the next few years. But looking at this draft, it starts at the top and it's, it's an easy start to the draft. Number one, the Jacksonville Jaguars own the pick. They are going to be selecting Trevor Lawrence out of Clemson. Trevor Lawrence, he's your prototypical quarterback. He's, you know, from Georgia, he's got the hair, he's got the look, he's dominated every level that he's played at. Um, He's won a national championship in his freshman year. They had Kelly Bryant, who was a a really great quarterback for Clemson the year before, but they have a freshman coming in, you know, a five, five five-star prospect. And they say, sorry, Kelly, you start the first four games of the year. Yeah, you've won all four, but after our bye week, Trevor Lawrence is our starting quarterback moving forward. After that, Kelly, Kelly Bryant has to transfer. You know, he doesn't really get heard from again uh, on a national level. And Trevor Lawrence just rises to start him. He wins, wins the uh, national championship in his first year. Then he gets his uh, sophomore season. They get to the divisional round, or so they get to the national championship. They get decimated by LSU, Joe Burrow, uh, Jamar Chase, who uh, I'll talk about in a minute. And then last year, he had an up and down season. He went through COVID midway, midway through the year. And then they ultimately lost in the, uh, the final four, losing to the Ohio State Buckeyes and uh, Justin Fields, who's also going to be in this draft. And he didn't have his best game. You know, Justin Fields definitely outplayed him. And if you look at his college career, Trevor Lawrence was at, at his best his freshman season. Now, he wasn't terrible as a sophomore or junior, but it was definitely his best football. And, but it's still, you know, he's been the number one pick since being – recruited out of high school and that's not going to change Jacksonville Jaguars head coach Urban Meyer who um, is a great you know a great coach at the college level has won two national championships um, including one at Ohio State but I think a big reason why Urban Meyer took the job is because he knew Jacksonville had that number one overall pick he's going to get a quarterback that he can mentor tutor and he's used to having younger guys you know Trevor Lawrence is 21 he's he's a different cat too he's a very religious person he just got married this past weekend and you know he's he's gonna go number one that that's that's an obvious but he's he's your guy he's been the you know he's the Connor McDavid so to speak of giraffes because a lot of people see him as a generational talent and a guy that's going to be at the top of the NFL you know quarterback hierarchy if you will for many years to come the number two pick belongs to the New York Jets. And I'd be shocked they did not select Zach Wilson out of BYU. 
Uh, Zach Wilson, again, a player who barely got the starting job this year uh, in BYU. He had to fight for it in, in, in a training camp, ultimately won it, had a great season. Um, but again, playing at BYU, a smaller program, not a power five. They, had, they went through, uh, he had a great season. The one loss that he had was against Coastal Carolina, who turned out to be a fantastic team this year. He struggled in that game. And, and you look at their schedule, they didn't have that many tough games. But what Zach Wilson possesses is the skills that the modern quarterback has. He has the, the flair of the Mahomes, the Aaron Rodgers, where he can throw you know behind his back. He can throw on the run. He's got legs. He, he's a... Uh, very athletic. So that's, what's intriguing. Is he a huge guy? No, he's about six, one, six, six, one. It's not a huge quarterback, but again, athletic, not like Lamar Jackson, but I would say he's similar athleticism to a Josh Allen, even though Josh Allen is in a six, five frame, Zach Wilson can break outside the pocket. Um, I would say maybe Ryan Tannehill, like ability to you know, Ryan Tannehill is an underrated runner where he can get get into space and he can break off a 20 yard rush. Zach Wilson is, is similar in, in that, in that degree where he doesn't, you know, the play can break down, but you can still get a positive play out of it because he's that he's athletic. He's a smart player and he knows when to, to run and when to pass. So that's one of the biggest attributes you can have. So it's been known for a long time. The jets have liked him. They decided to trade Sam Darnold to the Carolina Panthers who they drafted Sam Darnold three years ago, the number three overall pick. And now they're going to have the second overall pick and likely draft a quarterback. That's an NFL record. In a four-year span, they're going to draft two quarterbacks inside the top three, which it just tells you how bad the Jets have been. They've been searching for a quarterback since Joe Namath. Uh, you look at that division. The Miami Dolphins have been searching for a quarterback since Dan Marino. Uh, they had Tannehill. He was not the player under Adam Gay, said he is that he is now under Arthur Smith in Tennessee. So that's been a division devoid of quarterback play. Obviously you have Tom Brady there uh, for 20 plus years, but it, it's, it's tough in that division is two of the guy. That's another, another storyline that I'm sure we'll see develop over the season. But so that happened. Number three, this is where it starts getting interesting. The draft, it was originally Miami's pick. It was Houston's pick, but they traded it to Miami for Laramie Tunsil last year. And Houston last year, they got to the divisional round. So they traded a first round pick the following year thinking, well, we'll be a team that's on the rise. We're, we're going to make some noise here. They have a tear. They go three and 13. Uh, you know, that they, they, they're in turmoil. They've got gotten rid of a bunch of picks and it doesn't look good for Houston. So Miami had the pick, but then they swap with the 49ers. They got the, the 12th pick originally, they moved back up to six, but the 12th pick and two firsts in the, in the next two drafts for that number three overall pick. So San Francisco in the Super Bowl just two years ago, they're now moving up. They still have Jimmy Garoppolo on the roster, but he was he's injury prone and he hasn't been a consistent quarterback. So it, San Francisco, you don't trade up to three to select a, a tackle normally. They're going to be selecting a quarterback here as well. Now, based on all reports, they'll be selecting Mac Jones out of Alabama. And Mac Jones definitely checks all the boxes as a Kyle Shanahan quarterback. You look at the guys he's worked with, Matt Ryan, Kirk Cousins. These guys aren't that athletic, but they're athletic enough. I think, you know, we saw who won the Super Bowl this year, Tom Brady. Tom Brady is one of the least athletic quarterbacks in the history of the game. But what he's great at is noticing the rush and stepping into the pocket, using his feet to step into a throw, avoid a sack. Matt Jones is as competent. He's more athletic than Tom Brady. I think he's been getting hit because he's not athletic or you know, he's not the fastest runner. And you know, you have, you have your pro day where you have to run a 40. What's up? Who cares how fast you can run a 40? Okay, great. You ran a four, three, four. When you get on the field and you can't throw, it's not worth it's not worth anything. So I think Mac Jones will go. And again, he had a phenomenal season. One, again, we just saw Joe Burrow the previous season go undefeated. I think arguably had the greatest college football season by any quarterback in the history of the sport. Just pure dominance. And, you know, Mac Jones was similar. Never lost a game. He, him and Devontae Smith combined for over 20 touchdowns. He, uh, 
you know, just chucking for over 400 yards a game, it seemed like, and just with relative ease, even the national championship game, Ohio State really didn't put up much of a fight, and it turned out to be an easy win for the Crimson Tide. But it looks like Mac Jones will go. And again, I think it's still up for debate because you have two quarterbacks. There's going to be five gone in the first round for sure, potentially five quarterbacks in the first 10 picks. And if Jones doesn't go to San Francisco, I think it'll be Trey Lance. Now, Trey Lance is the enigma of this draft where he hasn't, he didn't play FBS. So that what I'm, what FBS is, is, you know, the power five schools, you know, the really great football programs, you know, the ACC, the PAC 12, he played at North Dakota state. Now, North Dakota state is known for producing quarterbacks. Uh, Carson Wentz went to North Dakota state. Um, he's had a decent career, but that, you know, it doesn't mean you can draft guys out of smaller schools and they can still have be very productive just because you don't play FBS doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a failure or a success, but for Trey Lance, this guy's very, his biggest attribute is athleticism, his ability to break outside the pocket, his speed. And he's an unknown because he only played one game last season. Played one game, then decided to opt out, knowing he was going to go to the draft. The year before, he played 17, was unbelievable, only threw two picks with over 20 touchdown passes, and they won the national championship for the lower level of college football. Now, it's it's different because the sky's the limit, but I think teams love Trey Lance because they don't know what, you know, they've seen Mac Jones, they've seen... um, Justin Fields, who I'll touch on in a minute. There's such a little sample size on Trey Lance that you say, well, he hasn't even uncovered half of what he can do. And the guy's 20 years old. He's young. He's like Sam Darnold when he came out. And it's, I think it's a, it's a reach for the 49ers. I think it would work. However, San Francisco does have Jimmy Garoppolo. He's a competent NFL quarterback. Is he going to win you a Super Bowl? Probably not. He did get them there, but he didn't win it for them. But he's not going to lose you that many games. He'll keep you in the fight. San Francisco's in a tough division where Seattle won the division last year. They're still very good. The Los Angeles Rams went out and acquired Matthew Stafford. They keep Leonard Floyd. They still have Aaron Donald and their plethora of weapons. And Arizona got better with, uh, you know, additions such as Rodney Hudson at center and J.J. Watt and potentially having Larry Fitzgerald back, but still having a comp- uh, adding A.J. Green in the receiving core. So this division gets tougher day after day to have a young, a rookie quarterback think that you can you know, run the table, win this division. I think it's a lot to ask, especially Trey Lance. So it would work for Trey Lance because I think he could sit for a while, learn, and maybe halfway through the season, you see him come in sort of like Tua Tagovailoa did with the Miami Dolphins when Ryan Fitzpatrick was sat after week seven. So those are two options there. The, the final quarterback that will be looked at, talked about, debated, I think, for a long time in this draft is Justin Fields. Justin Fields, quarterback at Ohio State. Obviously, he was a, a guy that really wanted Ohio State to come back. Nobody can question his love for the game of football. When, they had, when the Big Ten announced that they were not going to be playing football early September, he fought against it. He, his parents were with him at the... Uh, at the NCAA headquarters protesting saying that he wanted to play football, that yes, it was COVID and all these concerns, but he wanted to play. He ultimately came back and he had a, he had an up and down season. He played some great games against Rutgers and Michigan state and against teams that just quite frankly, aren't very good, but there's two games that you really look at and say, "Ah, is this really Justin Fields? He played Northwestern in the Big Ten Championship game. He only threw for 121 yards, had a QBR under 20, which is a quarterback rating. It's one of the more important stats. It includes running, uh, throwing, uh, just all the quarter, what, what you can do, the sacks you take, how you take them. So it, it takes it all and produces a stat for you. That's quarterback rating, 0 to 100. It was under 20. He threw for 121, two interceptions. Then there was the game. That was really the ugly one for me against Indiana, 
where he threw for under 200 yards, but he had three interceptions and they hung on to beat Indiana, Ohio state, but you know, they should have demolished Indiana and Ohio state being the great football program. They are, they did overcome it, but we've seen Justin Fields play fantastic in his sophomore season. He was up for the Heisman. If Joe Burrow had had such a fantastic season, Justin Fields, I think, would have got some consideration. And he really didn't have a bad game. So I, you, it's such a grain of salt with these, with these guys because they play great one minute and the next minute they, they look terrible. But where's, where's the middle ground? And for me, I, for Justin Fields, he keeps putting, getting pushed further and further back. And I think teams will regret it. If a team can swoop up and get him later in the draft, I think they'll get a good find. We saw him play against Clemson. This was a huge sign for me where I said, this guy's a little different. Played against Clemson in, in the in the ascent college football semifinal. He gets drilled by James Salski, the Clemson linebacker, right in the ribs, helmet first. He's clearly hurt. He has to sit out, I think, two plays. But he comes back, leads the team to a victory, has three touchdown passes, runs for another, and it was just an incredible performance where you, you could tell the guy's hurting, but he gutted his way into a victory and he gutted that team to the finish line. And I like that in a quarterback. You know, I like seeing a guy that is hurt, but he comes back on the field. He's not crying about it. He's not. And he just took it on the chin. And again, he was still banged up with the ribs in the, in the national championship game and they got demolished, but he fought valiantly. Was it his greatest game? No, but he's got a lot of things that you like just intangibles, the winning, the not quitting. Those are things I look for. Um, so those are the quarterbacks. Like I said, number, the first three picks are going to be quarterbacks. The fourth pick is the Atlanta Falcons. Now they had a three and 13 season. Dan Quinn was there for six years. The Atlanta Falcons have had a dark cloud under them since blowing that 28 to three lead in the Super Bowl. They haven't been able to overcome it. They haven't made the playoffs since Matt Ryan won the MVP that year. He hasn't been as good. Julio has been injured and their defense has just been a cascade of cast offs and injuries. Keanu Neal, Ricardo Allen, both tearing their Achilles tendons in the same season. Um, Vic Beasley just becoming a bust after tearing his ACL. So they've had some misfortune. Now looking at their roster, what do they need more than anything? Defense. But with that fourth pick, they're not going to be taking a defensive player because there's not a defensive player in the top of the draft that is just eye popping this year. So they do have a couple options. They have a number of options. They could keep the pick and take their parent. Cause I think if San Francisco takes Mac Jones, Atlanta has to seriously consider taking Trey Lance because Matt Ryan's 36. Now I still think he can play. But like I said, Trey Lance, I think, needs some time to sit behind somebody. Why not Matt Ryan? Matt Ryan's a pro's pro. And you sit behind him. You learn the offense. Arthur Smith's the new head coach. You get to work with him, practice, learn the system. And then when it's time for Matt Ryan to move on, and after this season, it's the best time with his cap number, with, with dead cap money, it would make the most sense to get rid of him this offseason. You have that option. So you could do that. Four, you can keep the pick again and draft a skill position player. I don't see them drafting a tackle. So it won't be Panay Sewell or Rashad Slater for Northwestern. I think if they're going to keep the pick at four and draft, I think they will select Kyle Pitts. And Kyle Pitts is a tight end out of Florida. And there's a lot of prospects that that get a lot of hype because it's the draft. You you know, every sport, oh, this player is going to be great. If it doesn't turn out, I think Kyle Pitts is the most sure thing to hit in this draft when it comes to being an impact player for 10 plus years. Of course, injuries can get in the way, but the way he played at Florida last year, he was so dominant every time he hit the field. Devontae Smith, of course, was dominant, but Pitts, he looks like an NFL tight end in college. He's got the Kelsey hands, the body of a Gronk. I still think he's developing. He, last year he was playing at about 240. I, I think they said they plan. He plans on being at 265 to start the year. So be, being even bigger, but he ran a four or five for what it's worth. They 
the guy can do anything. He can catch contested balls, a jump ball, a 50-50. He can run the route tree. And a lot of people have him as the second best prospect in the draft behind Trevor Lawrence. So if the Falcons keep the pick, if I think you have to select Pitts. It gives Matt Ryan another weapon. He really hasn't had a great tight end. Austin Hooper left in free agency. Tony Gonzalez has been gone for a period of time. Get him a, another legit weapon. You got Julio Jones. You got Calvin Ridley on both sides, and you have Kyle Pitts in the middle. It's a formidable uh, receiving core that can be really dangerous if you keep keep adding some decent running backs and uh, get your attack. But they also have a third option. That's to trade the pick. And if I'm Atlanta, I don't want to trade that far back. So I think there's a few teams that would be interested. And I'll go through them. You got the Carolina Panthers at eight. Carolina currently does have two quarterbacks on their roster. You got Sam Darnold, who they traded for. And I'm sure they'd like to play him, but Sam Darnold's he's in his four year, fourth year as a pro. And say the year goes great for him. Well, then you have to pick up his fifth year option and you have to think about paying him big money. And the key to winning right now is to have a rookie quarterback under contract. And do you want to pay Sam Darnold big money after just having one productive season? Three miserable ones with the Jets. And I still think he's got game. It's hard, so hard to evaluate him because you have Adam Gase, who's just a pit of despair and negativity on a player. We saw it with Tannehill. So Sam Darnold, you may just want to give him a chance. Teddy Bridgewater is also there as the qu- bridge quarterback, no pun intended. Uh, but so they have that option. But Carolina, they, you know, Matt Rule said they're not, they're not done looking at quarterbacks. So Falcons, they trade it to Carolina. Maybe Carolina likes Justin Fields. Maybe they like Trey Lance. Who knows? The Denver Broncos, they're at nine. I don't think Atlanta will want to trade below nine because you still want to draft a good player at nine. You might get Devonte Smith. You might get Kyle Pitts, maybe unlikely, but who knows you, you you'll still get a player that can be productive. You might get Rashawn Slater. You might have to draft a tackle or you can draft Micah Parsons, the linebacker out of uh, Notre Dame. So, or sorry, out of Penn state there. You can, you can do that. So, but the Denver Broncos have been searching for a quarterback really since John, you know, John Elway has been there for a while. He is he, the one quarterback he's hit on has been Peyton Manning and you can't give a guy that much credit for hitting on Peyton Manning. You know, Kate Manning, he was told his career was over. Indianapolis gave up on him. They were going to draft Andrew Luck. He had a serious neck injury. Doctors could have come back and play. He wins an MVP, likely should have won a second one. They won a Super Bowl, went to two. But other than that, you see Paxton Lynch, Trevor Simeon. Drew Locke has been playing for two seasons. He does not look like the answer long-term. They got Brett Rippon. They don't have a quarterback, a stable quarterback. John Elway has not had a stable quarterback since he's been there. It's been a constant moving door of quarterbacks where it's just been mediocrity after mediocrity. So who, they got Drew Locke on the roster right now. He's not the answer out of Mizzou. So would Denver want to move up? Uh, I'm sure. Because if the first year quarterbacks, it'll be who they like more. Do they like Justin Fields more? Or do they like Trey Lance? And they would get their pick of the letter. So, you know, there's some other teams I'm sure that would want a quarterback. You look at the Patriots. You look at the Washington Redskins. I'm sorry, the Washington football team. The Chicago Bears. So Patriots select 15, Washington's at 19, Chicago's at 20. That's too far down the line for me. You still want to draft the player and Atlanta, unless they're getting a big haul of players, I don't see them moving below the 10 mark. So that's their options. Fifth pick belongs to the Cincinnati Bengals and Cincinnati. To me, this pick's simple, but Cincinnati doesn't do a lot of smart things. So it worries me. The fifth pick, they should be taking a tackle. And there's two available. There's Penny Sewell out of Oregon and Rashawn Slater out of Northwestern. And yes, Jamar Chase is in the draft. He played with uh, Joe Burrow at LSU. He had 22 receiving touchdowns. He had almost uh, 1,900 yards. They had an incredible season together. You know, record-breaking. And Jamar Chase is going to be a great receiver. 
But what happened last year with Joe Burrow? He had got hit more than any other quarterback until his injury. Taking sack after sack hit, having to scramble because the team, the offensive line was terrible. So yes, would another receiver be great? Of course. But the smart thing to do is to draft Panay Sewell out of Oregon. Because what's Jamar Chase without Joe Burrow? If he's, he blew his, tore his ACL, MCL, and ACL last season. Hopefully, hopes to be back by training camp. If he's not around, and if he's only there two, three years and his career is over, then Jamar Chase is playing with backup quarterbacks and he's not going to be as, he's not going to be productive. You need to protect your asset. This guy went number one overall. You see him as the quarterback of your future for 10, 20 years. And you want to do everything you can to make sure that he's okay. You need to address that. The Cincinnati Bengals should be taking a quarterback. Uh, sorry, it should be taking a tackle, likely Panay Sewell out of Oregon. That brings us to six, the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins, um, I don't see them trade. They, again, they traded a few moves. The 49ers then traded with the Eagles to get back up to six. Clearly, they want a position player. So if everything goes to plan, it, the interesting thing would be if the Falcons take a position player. I think it'll be Pitts. So I'm going to say Pitts is off the board. Falcons keep the pick. I think they'll select Jamar Chase, but it wouldn't surprise me if they select Devontae Smith out of Alabama for a number of reasons. Devontae Smith played with Tua Tagovailoa, the Dolphins quarterback, at Alabama. They have a rapport. They know each other. Um, you know, Tua knows how great a route runner that Devontae Smith is. So they have that, you know, they have that connection already. Jamar Chase played at LSU. So can they learn it? Of course, but I think it would be intriguing for them to take Devontae Smith. I love Devontae Smith. You know, a lot of people are questioning because he's a small dude. He's 5'10", 170 pounds, but the guy can run routes better than anybody. And he's lightning fast. Won a Heisman Trophy as, as a wide receiver. That doesn't happen every day. And I think he can hack it in the NFL. Maybe he'll have to get a little bit bigger physically, just stronger, but the kid can play. And, you know, size has tried to determine people forever. You think of Russell Wilson, Jr. the third. You think of Drew Brees. You know, they were going to be no good quarterbacks because they were six feet tall. Well, that's not true. Lamar Jackson was wrote off because, well, he couldn't throw the football. He was only a runner. Well, he's got the second best win percentage in the NFL since he came into the league behind only Tom Brady. So just because you're different than this prototypical body type does not mean you're not going to be an effective player. And I think teams get caught behind looking back the, at the past saying, well, you know, this didn't work back then. Well, leagues change every day. People change. And, you know, I think Devontae Smith can be as productive as anybody uh, at his position. So I think it'll be Jamar Chase or uh, Devontae Smith taken there. So that leaves Detroit at seven. You know, if, if Atlanta traded the pick for a quarterback, I think Detroit would want to take Kyle Pitts because they could put TJ Hawkinson and um, Kyle Pitts together have a two uh, tight end set, kind of like what the Patriots are doing. But they could also trade that pick because I, you know, in this scenario, these picks are going down and none of them are quarterbacks. So it would be Justin Fields or Trey Lance still sitting there. So could Detroit, Detroit could swap with, say, Denver and Denver's at nine. She's only moving down two picks and Denver could move up, take Justin Fields or Trey Lance, because they both could be there. And then you have your pick of the litter. I think you'd still get a really good player. You would get, like I mentioned, maybe Devontae Smith just falls in your lap because Carolina, they got some good wide receivers. Maybe they take a defensive player. Maybe they take Rashawn Slater, a, a tackle. Or maybe they, they're sitting there saying, well, Trey Lance, Justin Fields or Trey Lance is still here. Maybe we should take him or they trade the pick. Again, it can be pandemonium. That's what's so fun. And it, this is just the top of the draft. There's still going to be some great, great, great players taken. You know, uh, Patrick Sertan III out of, out of Alabama, the corner. He looks like a great player. I mentioned Micah Parsons out of Penn State. Um, he, you know, Caleb Farley, uh, Horn out of uh, Virginia Tech. Rashad Bateman, the wide receiver out of uh, Minnesota. There's going to be some good players go later in the draft. I think it's a very deep draft. And when it comes to, of course, the, 
the thing you think about at the top is just you know, quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. But the skill position players you know, later in the draft, what did the Buffalo Bills do? I think the Buffalo Bills are a, a good running back away from beating the Kansas City Chiefs, competing for a Super Bowl. Can they get their hands on Najee Harris? I mean, they got the 29th pick. Is Najee Harris still going to be there? Are they going to have to move up to get him? I think he's the best running back available. You know, a lot of people do not like taking running backs in the first round, but I think he's worth it the way he played at Alabama. He can catch, he can run, he's a load to bring down. So does Buffalo move up and get him? I know I just went through a good plethora of the first 10 picks, but it's going to be fun. You know, do the Patriots actually trade up and select a quarterback, which they've never done in the first round? Can Chicago do something with their quarterbacks? I mean, Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy are in a win now year. If they don't win this year, they're going to be fired. And they've got to be worried because their QB one right now, as they put on Twitter a few weeks ago, is Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton. It was they were they wanted Russell Wilson. They wanted Deshaun Watson. It's Andy Dalton right now with Nick Foles behind him. That's not a good position to be in if you're uh, Ryan Pace, saying my ass is on the line here. I got to win this year. You gonna trust in Andy Dalton, the Dallas Cowboys backup quarterback last year? I wouldn't feel secure with that. So can they do anything? But this is just part of what makes this draft so interesting because there's so many moving parts and what do teams want and what, what's the asking price? And it honestly will get more interesting, I think, as the quarterbacks go because where do the skill position players end up? Who does Kyle Pitts fall in the draft? Because if Atlanta trades that pick, I think he'll fall and do the Dolphins feel pressure to take him? They still have Mike Gusecki, who's a great tight end. But again, you go double tight end set, which is what the Patriots did forever with uh, the late Aaron, Hern- late Aaron Hernandez and, and Rob Gronkowski. So lots to watch here. Uh, the, the draft should be a lot of fun. Uh, it always is. And I know for me, it, it's just, it's a night where you, you get to sit back and just watch NFL teams do work. Um, trying to, best build the roster for not only, you know, the future, but you know, what's the reaction? You know, if there's uh, fans from different places there, you hear the boos. I can think of the giants selecting Daniel Jones a few years ago with the sixth pick. They saw that as a reach. A lot of people were booing, didn't like it. And yeah, they're kind of right so far. So it's, it's always fun. And, uh, but the NFL draft coming up a week from Thursday uh, live from uh, from Cleveland, Ohio. Not too far down the road from a little farther down. You got the Central Division in the NHL. It was really the Central Division night last night because you had pretty much every team playing in it. You had um, Tampa Bay and Carolina playing last night. You had Florida, Columbus. You had Dallas uh, against uh, Detroit and Nashville, Chicago. So yeah, every team was playing. And a few headlines for me. Obviously, this is a, a division that I think is a lot tougher than than people give it credit for, including me early in the season. I didn't think this would be a very tight division or, or very competitive. But as we get to the end of the season, you know, Tampa, I still think it's an elite threat, but that Kucherov hasn't played this year. Stamkos is on injured reserve. They made some trades, still trying to find themselves. David Savard had a tough first night, was minus four, but – Great game last night, playing almost 24 minutes. Him and Hedman are playing together, even just being the steady defenseman that he always has been in, in Columbus. But they're playing Carolina. Tampa Bay jumps out to an early 2-0 lead. Carolina scores uh, about nine minutes in the second period. Andre Svechnikov, nine seconds into a power play. And Brady Shea scores a minute and 11 seconds into the third period to tie it up. And it stays that way for Mrazek, makes some big saves. Uh including a big one to Ross Colton late in the game where he had a partial breakaway. Uh, Vasilevsky was solid in the net, but it goes into overtime and Tampa Bay finds a way to win. Yanni Gord, just a relentless forward, strips the puck from Brett Pesci in his own in, own zone, brings it to the net, stopped originally by Mrazek, but he taps in his own rebound. Tampa gets to win 3-2 in overtime. And with this win, Tampa now ties themselves with Florida and Carolina for first, Carolina does have top spot 
because of games in hand. But a big win. I'm sure uh, John Cooper's a bit upset because you had a 2-0 lead. You relied on overtime to win. You give your opponent a point. But a, a big win, uh, nonetheless, for Tampa Bay. For Carolina, good good fight back. And I just look at, at this Carolina team. You had this, both these teams, they're built with their defense cores. You got Hedman. You got McDonough, Savard, Ser, uh, Sergachev, uh, Chernak. Then you have Slavin and Pesci and Dougie Hamilton on the other side. And these guys are playing close to 25 minutes a night. And again, Jacob Slavin is a guy that's just an underreported great player where he can play 25, 26 minutes a night with relative ease. And you don't even know him. Again, he's got two goals on the season. He doesn't put up many points. I don't care. I don't care. I want him on my team. Again, he's going to be like, I think he's going to pick the United States. He'll be on the United States Olympic team playing a top four role. And I think that'll take a lot of guts for a GM, the GM of the team to do it. Because nowadays, if you don't put up 80 points as a defenseman, you're useless. But yet Jacob Slavin, I think I, you could argue when Jordan Stahl decides to hang them up, which I don't see it being all that soon because he's having one of his best years in a long time. Slavin will be the, the next captain of the Carolina Hurricanes. It's his work ethic, the way he presents himself. And he's been there, done that, and went through trials and tribulations with this team. But a big win for Tampa Bay. Again, they tied them in the standings. Florida playing Columbus. Couple headlines. Sam Bennett scores his first goal as a Panther. And the Panthers' cast offs continue to produce. Frank Vitrano has 17 goals. Again, this guy was in Boston. He was playing a bottom six role. He was a the guy they let go to waivers. Florida claimed him. Another Carter Verhege story, but 17 goals for him. Great story. That's two different guys, uh, three different guys this year that have been on waivers in their career to score at least 17 goals. You got Vetrano, you got Verhege, you have Colin Blackwell for the Rangers. So these guys are making the most of, of their new locale, making the most of an opportunity and just having a great career. But after, you know, so much, uh, you know, p- uh, teams just giving up on them and saying, you know, anybody can have them. And Florida does a lot with players at teams that they just don't want. So Florida gets the win. They beat Columbus 4-2. Uh, not a big surprise there. Nash, Columbus is 1-11-1 and and in the last 12. They're just abysmal right now. The bigger headline for me, for Columbus, Max Domi. He was a healthy scratch last night. Max Domi, um, you know, Montreal had him for two seasons. He was great in his first season uh, since being traded for Galchenyuk. Came over at 25 goals. Looked like a player who's going to be an impact guy in Montreal for years. Second season, not so great. Really um, inconsistent. Was frustrated with his role. Um, and then Claude Julien really put him in the doghouse, and he couldn't get out of it. He was on the fourth line and couldn't be productive. He gets to Columbus, and he didn't have a lot of time playing up in the lineup because Torch just didn't like his game. And he's been on the third or fourth line all year, trying to work his way up, getting some power play opportunities. But Tim and Torch have been – button heads all year and last night it came to a head no pun intended again where he's a healthy scratch and torts is going to be gone in columbus columbus is going through a state of transition they do have domi signed for another year under contract so that's a difficult situation but domi was traded straight up for josh anderson and you know some people don't like the josh anderson contract in montreal too many years too much value Whatever, I love him. I think the contract's worth every penny because I think the kid's a winner. And I like Max too, but he's too inconsistent. And I see him, they want to play him at wing. They want to play him at center. Pick a position. The same with Sam Bennett in Florida. Is he a winger? Is he a center? Sometimes asking the player is not the right thing because they flip-flop. For Max Domi, for Sam Bennett, two guys that are really fringe players at this point where they've been guys who've been expected to do more and they've done less. I think for each of them, be a winger, or be a center, but don't be both pick a position and stick to it. And for Max Domi, he's had to resort to fighting. He's gotten involved with Connor Murphy over the weekend. I know Torch didn't like it because he, there was a penalty on the play and for him to be traded for Josh Anderson, who's been a really productive forward in Montreal 
a difference maker. Max has never been a difference maker for the Columbus Blue Jackets. He's never changed lives. And I'm not saying Josh Anderson's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but he's a, he's a good player that's productive every time he's on the ice. And you know what you're going to get from him, game in, game out. With Max, it's too inconsistent. You don't know. I think at his peak, he's a really productive player. Again, I love him as a player, but it's just not there consistently. So I don't blame Torts for healthy scratching him. But as a looking at Columbus and their future, you have him under contract next year for over $5 million. And he's a healthy scratch this year. Again, likely new coach, new philosophy. But he had his best season in Montreal in a big market where there's pressure. I think Max does better when there's media on him. He's great with the media, but I think he's better when there's media than when there's pressure. Columbus, Arizona, these markets, they're small markets. They don't get publicity. Nobody cares, so to speak. Again, I do, but I'm in the minority. So for him, I think going to a bigger media market where there's attention would do him a lot of good. Again, playing in New York, playing in Toronto, Montreal, Chicago to an extent. These big markets are would be a better place for Max. So maybe he finds his way out of Columbus, but that would be his third team in three seasons and that's a tough look too because once you get on that train again he's go that's you're going down the train of Alex Galchenyuk and maybe you know Galchenyuk's found some success in Toronto but you don't want to be uh, you know a sleeping bag for the rest of your career either the other two games Nashville disposes of Chicago 5-2 big win because if Chicago had won in regulation Chicago would have tied Nashville in the standings and actually taken sole possession of fourth place in in the set in the central however they don't nashville wins five two you know luke cunning they get some gold matt duchene finally scores a goal matthias at home actually has more goals than matt duchene this season six to four but it, the game was really sealed uh nashville scored two goals in, in 20 seconds apart to begin the third period and i put the game on ice kevin lankin and was pulled after 41 seconds in the third period and so now that they have a four-point lead on chicago but however, Dallas, I mentioned yes them yesterday. They're creeping up the standings. They played they played Detroit last night. Robertson gets another point, gets a goal for for Dallas. Uh, Detroit fights hard, but Dallas wins the game in the gimmick, which is the shootout. If you don't follow to the point here, I call it the gimmick. They get the win in the shootout, three to two, and they're they're now four points behind Nashville with three games in hand. And it's an interesting week for these teams because Nashville plays Chicago Wednesday and Friday. Huge games uh, for Chicago and Nashville to stay ahead for Chicago. If they lose both of those games, they're really out of it. You're not making up those points down the stretch. There'll be less than 10 games left. You might as well start, you know, booking tee times. Dallas plays Detroit tonight and Thursday. So they play Detroit another two times. You have to win both of them. You have to win it. You have to win both those games. Detroit's the worst team in the division. Take advantage of a really porous team and get the points. Again, you had to go to a shootout last night. That's not ideal. I'm sure if you're, uh, if you, if you're the, the management there with Jim Nil, but you're, you're happy. You at least got the two points, but you hope Chicago can do you a few favors this week. And potentially by the end of this week, Dallas, who's just a terrible start with COVID and just poor play. They could be in, in a playoff position, and I don't think a lot of people saw that coming even midway through the season because they look like they're out of it, but they've been fighting the whole year. You know, Jason Robertson, Joe Pavelski, players have stepped up, and they're right back in the, in the middle of things here. Patrick Marlowe. I talked about this yesterday, how I, I have an uneasy feeling of him passing Gordy Howe's record. I don't think it's as important as other people because I think he's – Clearly he loves the game because you got to love the game to keep showing up year after year. But I think Gordy Howe played longer at a higher level than Patrick Marlowe ever has. He's been playing three, four seasons where he's been a fourth line player. And I'm not sure if he's not Patrick Marlowe chasing a record. He's not a healthy scratch more often. And that might be a, a tough criticism, but that's just, that's just my opinion. Since that first year in Toronto, he's been a guy that, I'd much rather play a younger player than Patrick Marlowe, but San Jose bring, brought him back. They're terrible this year. They were terrible last year. So you play him when he got traded to Pittsburgh. 
he had no impact. He played in the playoffs. He, you, some people probably don't even remember that he was a Pittsburgh Penguin for five minutes, but he was and really didn't have much impact on the series, on their team. So that's kind of where he is. He's at the back end of his career. I mean, he's, it's incredible him and Joe Thornton, both drafted in 1997, 1-2, are still playing. I mean, that, that deserves a ton of credit in and of itself. But last night, he passed Gordy Howe playing in his 17th and 78th game, which is just astounding. You know, to avoid injury that long, you got to give him credit, and I will here. It's a longevity award, but to stay healthy, there's guys, I, I listened to Ray Ferraro yesterday in overdrive say, you know, I played 1,270 or something along those lines, you know, and I didn't, you know, they didn't ask me to leave. I just, that, that's what I could play. For him to be able to play that many that many games is impressive. Um, it ultimately wasn't a losing effort. They lost to Vegas. He played a little over 17 minutes in the game. A lot, ton of respect. He was honored after the game. And, you know, you even got a, a cry in with Drew Amanda, who does uh, the Sharks games after, just saying he loves it. You know, the players and the different coaches he's had over the years, and there's nothing like playing hockey to him. So maybe I'll be wrong, but – he passed the record. That's done. He got past Gordy Howe. I think he's been chasing that for a long time. And I think he wants the record, of course. But I think after this season, he's done. He loves the game. But it could prove me wrong if San Jose does bring him back next season. Or if he even wants to come back. Because if he goes through another 82-game grind after you know COVID and all this and breaking the record... Maybe he just does love the game of hockey. It's not about the record. That would prove to me more that it is more about the game and the all times game played, you know, the Iron Man streak and things of that nature. So incredible career for Patrick Marlowe went second overall in 1997, was worthy of the pick. Still playing in 2021 is an incredible feat. Um, and, you know, congratulations to him and his family. I'm sure it was a special moment for sure. Um, and if this is his final you know, swan song, so to speak, in, in the NHL, he can look back on his career and be really proud of what he accomplished because, you know, he had to go through a lot of barriers. He had to uh, go through a lot of grinds. I mentioned yesterday, the San Jose Sharks organization did not always treat him with, with the most respect, stripping him of a captaincy, uh, kind of berating him, uh, just putting Joe on a pedestal and putting Joe Bavelski on a pedestal above him. He took that as a pro and he, he took it in stride. Great career with the Olympic team. Again, I don't think Patrick Marlowe is a hockey hall of famer, um, but they are allowing more and more people in that I don't think should be anymore. You know, it's the hall of everybody and not the hall of fame anymore. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me that he gets in, but nevertheless, great career. It's a longevity award. I don't see it much more than that. I, definitely impressive, but uh, I still put Gordie Howe, a little higher than Marlowe. And again, that might be a contrarian. I am a contrarian, but that's just my viewpoint on this. Also, you know, we learned yesterday, uh, Alex Edler suspended two games uh, for the, the tripping five minute major on uh, Zach Hyman. And um, again, I won't get into that again. I talked about it yesterday. I don't think it was a five minute major in the game. And I don't think it was a two game suspension. That's for damn sure. But uh, Alex Edler will serve the first of his two game suspension tonight against the Toronto Maple Leafs as they play again in Vancouver. Um, so they look for another replacement after all the COVID issues, Edler can't play. So he forfeits, I think it's over a hundred thousand dollars in, in pay for missing these games because of the suspension. But the bigger news for, for the Toronto Maple Leafs is that Zach, Zach Hyman is a ACL strain. He's going to miss two weeks. So two weeks pushes you to many and, they only got 10 games left. He's going to have to work some games in quick and, and get back into the lineup. But it's tough news because I think you could argue Zach Hyman is Toronto's second most important forward. I would still put Marner above Hyman, but Hyman's third for me. He's above Tavares. Um, Tavares has played really well, I'd say, over the last two, three weeks. But consistently all year, Zach Hyman, you know what you're getting from him. John Tavares... I have, I have more faith that Zach Hyman's going to produce and give you his game on a nightly basis than I do John Tavares. That's just how I see it. Um, 
they got to hope he can come back healthy. He did blow out that knee a few years ago in, in the playoffs towards ACL, but it's not an ACL tear. And I think a couple of weeks, you get a few games in for the playoffs. Zach Hyman should be fine. What this what this does, is, and I predict, I thought the Maple Leafs would do this anyway, but I think they have the green light to do it now. Nick Foligno, when he comes back, I believe he'll be on the line with Matthews and Marner. The first game that he's there, um, I think he get, can get out of quarantine to or tomorrow, and but he'll take some time to skate and, and get in shape, of course. But I think he'll head out to Winnipeg. Maybe he plays Saturday night. They play in Vancouver tonight in Winnipeg uh, Thursday and again in Winnipeg on Saturday. So maybe that's the night he makes his debut. I think he'll be on a line with Matthews and Marner now that Hyman's gone. Is he as good as Zach Hyman? No. Is he as fast as Zach Hyman? No. He doesn't retrieve pucks as good as Zach Hyman, but he's close to Zach Hyman. And I think they want to see if he can play that role because they want to push Zach Hyman down for whatever reason. Maybe just try to make their team better, but I, I'd rather have them go get the puck. Zach Hyman get the puck for those guys. Felino, I think, could play with Tavares and um, Bill Nylander if you need him to. You know, they love uh, Daryl Sittler, uh, a.k.a. Alex Galchenyuk in that spot, but maybe you want a different look. Tavares and Nylander aren't exactly bump and grind guys, especially Bill, um, but – could he fit there? I mean, they do, they like that skill line, but we'll see. But I think Felino, with this Hyman injury, it guarantees in my brain that he will be on that top line whenever he's off the COVID list, whenever he's healthy enough to play. I see him being with Matthews Marner, the first chance he gets. Uh, Sheldon Keefe use this as a, as a learning opportunity. And when Hyman comes back, that'll be the real decision time. Because if, if Felino's had success with those two, he'll likely stay there. But if, you, if it's a few games where it looks out of place and it, you know, it doesn't look kosher, so to speak, then you can make adjustments. You can put Zach Hyman back on that line. You know, it's going to work. It has for 50 games this year. So in, interesting development there. And also, of course, in Leafland, your big concern has got to be goaltending. You know, is for Frederick, Frederick Anderson, is he getting any close to being able to play? Jack Campbell lets in a few softies and, you know, the sky is falling in Toronto. So stuff to watch there for sure. Uh, but Zach Hyman's injury could have been worse. Again, um, he left the game. I think it's the only reason Edler got a five game, a five uh, minute major on that play. Shouldn't be that way. Uh, I talked about that with Craig last night. An injury should not impact how you call it. If, if a guy if it's a check from behind, but the guy turned, but the guy broke his nose and his blood everywhere, that shouldn't be okay. You get kicked out of the game. It happens more often than you think. Or even when there's fans in the building, if you, if you heard fans reaction, start booing after a play, a ref would throw up a hand late. And that's, that's just not the way I see things. So it, we'll see what happens in Leafland. Again, they got Vancouver again tonight. Uh, no Hyman. And it looks like Bill Nylander is not going to play either. Uh, apparently he missed a team meeting and Sheldon Keith said he may not play tonight. So interesting development there where Keith's kind of laying down the law uh, on the road, him missing a team meeting. I think that sets a good precedent. I don't disagree with it whatsoever. Um, you know, you need to be accountable. And if all your teammates are there ready and you're not, and they're waiting for you, uh, I think we all know in life, if you're, just waiting for somebody and then they don't, they just keep doing it. Well, that's a pattern of, of negative behavior. If you don't do something about it, they'll continue to take liberties until you do. So it, it might be no Nylander tonight. Uh, so it could be an interesting lineup where likely if he, if Nylander's out, likely Angval will check back into the lineup potentially. And then you, the Toronto Maple Leafs the other night had that fourth line of Spezza, Thornton, and uh, Simmons. And, um, yeah, I, um, I think it was a one-night experiment. And um, potentially two-thirds of that line won't be even in the playoff lineup come come game one. But slow line, and uh, we'll see if they bring that back tonight, but that's ugly. Uh, but So that's probably going to do it for today. I was going to go into some NBA, but tonight I'm going to be with Sheamus. Um, 
we're we're gonna cover succession but we, we ran into a couple of roadblocks we're still kind of debating on a new show so we're gonna talk some nba tonight uh talk about steph curry and his tear lately um shay's boston celtics the best young players in the nba and so that's gonna be fun and technically tonight with Seamus will be episode 100 and you know it's a big that's a big milestone for me. I'm really excited about it um, to get to 100, but um, it's going to be episode 100, but I'm going to do a special this week. And I mentioned yesterday, I'm going to have a special guest on Thursday. And that special guest, I'm going to say right now, is going to be former NHL GM, former NHL president, head coach, media personality, Doug McLean. Uh, Doug McLean uh, recently worked for Sportsnet. He does a show with Nick Kiprio. It's called Real Kipper at Noon right now. He's a, a great personality. He's from Summerside PEI, so an Atlantic, Atlantic guy. Um, and he's going to join me Thursday at 4 o'clock. You can see that live on YouTube um, where I'll be uh, doing an interview with him. Um, like I said, 4 o'clock live. Um, it'll be on podcast after the fact, uh, the whole nine but I'm super excited to uh, interview Doug and, you know, for everybody to kind of tune in, hopefully uh, you're around or you can see it after the fact. If you have some questions for Doug, you can write them in the comments because we'll be live. And if they're appropriate and I vet them, then I'm, I might ask it on the air. So that's on the, what's, that's, what's on the horizon for me. I really hope I can start you know doing some more interviews, but this was a, a special one for me. I've wanted to interview Doug for a while now. And to get that opportunity this week is, is something pretty special for me. And I, I, uh, I can't wait for Thursday to be able to do that. So that's the special guest. Um, that'll be posted later on, on social media channels about me interviewing Doug. So I really hope you guys can tune into that or check it out after the fact, because I think it's gonna be a special one and, and a whole lot of fun. So um, thank you guys for, for uh, listening today. Hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe in these times. And like I said, I'll be back tonight with Seamus to talk some basketball and some other things as well. So take care, everybody. Stay safe. We'll talk soon.